Morning. Get your Bibles out. Please put your hand up if you don't have a Bible, and we will bring one right to you. And when you get a Bible in your hands, open up to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. What I want to do this morning is I just want to brag on the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, every time on Sunday morning when it's time to preach the Word, we should be bragging on the person of Jesus Christ because He is the living truth that the written truth is all about. I'm going to read you just one verse out of Colossians chapter 1 this morning. It's not even an entire sentence. It's just a phrase, a statement about Jesus Christ, about His identity, and I want to spend the entire sermon just um, focusing on, expounding upon, meditating and musing upon the truth contained in that verse about the person of Jesus. And so we're going to read Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. I know this is just a half of a sentence, but in honor of the Word of God, would you please stand with me as we read Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Here's what Paul wrote in this verse about Jesus. Colossians 1, 19, For in Him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell for in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Heavenly Father, I just ask you by the person of the Holy Spirit, would you right now just take this truth and send it out in power. Let Jesus be lifted up. Let any distraction or attempts of the enemy to belittle the name or keep hearts from hearing and receiving the truth that would just be thwarted by the power of the Spirit and that your word would accomplish what you desire and achieve the purpose for which you send it as Jesus is exalted in Christ's name. I pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so before we jump into the details of this verse, I just want to give you a sampling. I'm going to just read for you a fairly lengthy bullet list of truths about the person of Jesus Christ that are included in the Word of God by way of His names or titles. And I'm not going to give you the comprehensive list. This is just a sampling of what the Word of God says about the Son of God that'll help set the stage for us looking deeply into all the fullness of God that is pleased to dwell in the person of Jesus Christ. So truths about Jesus, biblical truths. Jesus is our advocate <clears throat> with the Father, the Almighty. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the ruler of God's creation, the beloved Son, the bread of life. He's the Good Shepherd, the Great Shepherd, and the Chief Shepherd. He's the capstone. He's the creator the deliverer, the desire of all nations, the gate, the chosen of God, the faithful witness, the first and the last, the firstborn, the glory of God, the head of the church, the heir of all things, the holy child, the holy one, the holy one of Israel, the holy one of God, the I am. 
the image of God, the exact imprint of God's nature, Emmanuel, Jehovah, the judge of Israel, the righteous one, the king, the king eternal, the king of the Jews, the king of kings, the king of the ages, the lawgiver, the lamb, the lamb of God, the life, the light of the world, the bright morning star, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lord of all, the Lord of glory, the Lord of lords and the Lord our righteousness. <clears throat> A man of sorrows, the mediator, the messenger of the covenant, Messiah, the anointed one, the mighty God, the mighty one, the morning star, the only begotten son, our Passover, the author of life, prince of peace, prophet, redeemer, the resurrection and the life, the rock, the root of David, the rose of Sharon, the offspring of the woman, the shepherd and overseer of our souls, the son of the blessed one, the son of God, the son of the most high, the son of man, the son of righteousness, the true light, the true vine, the truth, the witness, the word, the word of God, the friend of sinners, Jesus. Just a sampling of the names and titles given to Jesus in the Word of God to whet your spiritual appetite and turn the focus upon this one verse in Colossians 1.19. All of those names and titles are true of the person of Jesus Christ because in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And so let's consider, let's meditate on, let's Muse upon the Master as we consider just a little finite way or ways in which the infinite truth of Jesus being all the fullness of God. The subject matter of Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20 is about the supremacy of Jesus. And here in verse 19, we have a statement about His identity. He is supreme because of who He is. And so, let's look at the fullness of God and consider it in Jesus. What aspects of the fullness of God in Jesus can we bring out, let me just focus on three words in this phrase to do this. In this half of a sentence, we're going to look at three specific words. Spend a little time on each word and bring out from that word some aspects of the fullness of God in Jesus. First of all, the word all, for in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Focus in on that word all, that's a comprehensive word, <clears throat> a word that lacks nothing. That's by nature of the definition, all, it's a word that lacks nothing. Jesus in all of God's fullness lacks nothing. 
It was the Father's pleasure that in Jesus all of the fullness of God lacking nothing would dwell. We live in a world, a world that is void and empty. A world whose allurements do not satisfy, whose pleasures are fleeting. In a world that promises much, but whose bank account is empty. Better said, it's overdrawn. It's not just empty, it's overdrawn. What specifically does the world lack? We could make, if we had time and a mind that could do it, we could list hours upon hours of things that the world lacks. Let me just give you one thing to emphasize this idea of all of the fullness of God dwelling in Jesus. One grand category of what this world lacks is that this world lacks peace. It's true, isn't it? I mean, just any night, turn on the news in three minutes, there'll be testimony around the world that we are not a world in peace. What we have is wars and rumors of wars and brother against brother and children against parents and spouses against one another and the right wing against the left wing and on and on. A world in turmoil. A world lacking peace. But in Christ, in Christ, we have the all-sufficient one who lacks nothing. The title that I would give to this idea of all is this, full sufficiency. In Jesus, there is full sufficiency. He lacks nothing. I'll give you some statements just about the peace of Jesus. Just this one aspect that I emphasized about our world lacking. In Jesus Christ, we have the Prince of Peace. These are going to be, I'm not going to give you chapter and verse, but I'm going to be quoting passages or phrases from Scripture as we go down through this entire message. I want you to just stay here on this one statement in Colossians 1.19, but I'm going to give you many different statements, quotes from Scripture. In Jesus, we have the Prince of Peace. We have one who at his birth, there was an angelic announcement. And that angelic announcement was this, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. In Christ, we have the one who conquered hatred with love and sin with sacrifice. In Christ, the great one, he taught us to repay evil with good. He said, when someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. All of these are under this umbrella of peace. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Christ is the same authority who stood up on the boat that day in the midst of a raging storm and he looked into the storm and he commanded the tumult to die down and become calm. He said, peace be still. And immediately the waves ceased. And the wind died down and the sea was completely calm as glass. In this world of turmoil, the Prince of Peace gave us a promise. He said, in this world you will have turmoil, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 
full sufficiency. And one way that he does that in his all of God's fullness is by bringing peace into our lives in a world of turmoil. Where is there turmoil in your life? Where is a storm raging? Where is there division and strife and anger and contention and unforgiveness? Where are you lacking peace? In Christ, all of God dwells. All of His fullness dwells. He lacks nothing. Full sufficiency. And He is still, as He did that day, the Sea of Galilee, He is still calming storms. He is still speaking His voice into the turmoil and the tumult of life and He is bringing peace. He can do that for you if you need that. Second word in this verse. Let me read the verse again. Colossians 1.19 For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The word I want you to focus on here is fullness. All the fullness of God was pleased to to dwell. The title I'm going to give this is Full Riches. Full Riches. You see, this is a word here, fullness, that pictures abundance. It pictures riches. It's a word that's a perfect complement to the word all. Here is how the word fullness is a perfect complement to the word all. The word all again means lacks nothing. The word fullness means has everything. He lacks nothing. He has everything. Because in Him all the fullness of God dwells. Jesus is fully sufficient, the one who can meet your deepest need and your every need. And Jesus is also the one that is full of riches to complement His full sufficiency. In Him, we have provided to us everything that we need. All the blessings of God are in Jesus. There's an endless storehouse to His riches. As difficult as it would be when I asked you earlier about what are the ills of this world for us to try to catalog the evils of this world, it would be infinitely more impossible to try to catalog all of the realities of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Do you need wisdom or knowledge? Here's what it says in Colossians 2, in Him, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Have you ever been in need of grace? Or are you in need of it now? Are you in need of truth? If you're someone that has found yourself guilty and undeserving and standing in a, the pit of a mistake, Longing for someone to come alongside your life and reach down and extend grace to you and help you out of that pit. Then Jesus is your answer. It seems to me that grace and truth, they are the two things that all of humanity is constantly in need of. Listen, John chapter 1. Jesus is the glory of the one and only who came from the Father and He's full of something. And guess what He's full of? He's full of grace and truth. John 1.16 From the fullness of His grace 
We have all received one blessing after another. How about sorrow? Have you ever found yourself in or are, in, are you in the valley of sorrow? Have you filled in that valley with your own tears until the waters rose and it became a mighty current threatening to sweep you away? Your need of compassion and mercy is in Jesus Christ, James 5.11. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We talked about this last week. Do you need armor for the battle? Are you fighting in a spiritual war against the enemy of your soul? An enemy who knows your weakness and who is very accurate with his fiery darts, shooting them at you at inopportune times. What you need is the full armor of God. And how do you receive and put on and walk in the full armor of God? The answer to that is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the full armor of God. Jesus is all of the fullness of God. He is all, meaning he lacks nothing. He is the fullness, meaning he has everything. So full sufficiency, full riches, word number three. Verse 19 again of Colossians 1, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The word I want to focus in on now is the word dwell. What is it that the fullness of God does in Jesus? It dwells there. What is that word picture what's the emphasis here this is an abiding fullness that's descriptor number three this is an abiding fullness i see at least three things here related to the abiding fullness of god in the person of jesus christ first of all that it dwells there means this that the fullness of God in Jesus is never absent. That's said in the negative way. Never absent. Said in the positive way that the fullness of God in Jesus is always present. Never absent, always present. That word here dwells, it's talking about something that is remaining, something that is constant. This is, fullness is an eternal condition. Because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is and was and always will be as He he always has been. And so the fullness that dwells in Him will forever remain. For an eternal existence, all the fullness of God has dwelt in the person of Christ. So in this world of upheaval and turmoil that is moving ever more rapidly into increasing chaos toward ultimate destruction into that world, Jesus is the unchanging, unshifting, unmovable cornerstone in which the infinite and perpetually dwelling fullness of God remains. Let me say that again. He is the unchanging, unshifting, unmovable cornerstone in which the infinite and perpetually dwelling fullness of God remains. So therefore, we can have some confidence. We can have the confidence that the blood of Jesus will never lose its power. We can have confidence that the truth of Jesus is never going to lose its relevance that the love of Jesus will never meet its conqueror. Matter of fact, let me just read you a few verses from Romans chapter 8 from the pen of the same author of Colossians, Romans 8, 35, 38, and 39. Paul asks the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And then he answers his question down in verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus our Lord. Love of Christ will never meet its conqueror. It will conquer all. And then the liberation of Christ. The liberation of Christ will never be defeated. Here's the truth. John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. You are free indeed. So abiding fullness means in Him the fullness of God is never absent, always present. Here's the second thing that that abiding fullness means. It means that it's always accessible. It's always accessible. You see, God the Father was pleased to have all of His fullness dwell in Jesus. And what did Jesus do? What significant thing did Jesus do in past history for us? He, as the second member of the triune God, He joined His divine nature with the human nature and He came down to planet earth. He wrapped His divinity in humanity. He joined His divine nature with a human nature so that He was absolutely fully man. Fully God and fully man. He made Himself one of us. Actually came and made Himself a servant among us. And he did that so that we could know God. We could see him in human flesh, hear him, touch him, walk with him, see him. He is the God who knows your struggles. He's the God who has felt your pain. He's the God who has faced your temptations. He's the God who understands your weaknesses. God in Jesus is the accessible God to you and me. And when you come to Jesus, you are coming to the God that all of the fullness of deity dwells. God forever remains accessible to those who are in Christ because if you're in Christ, you are in the One in whom all the fullness of God dwells. He's the knowable and the approachable God. What God has to offer, and by the way, He has a lot to offer. All that He has to offer, you get from Jesus. Matter of fact, you get it only because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And you get it fully from Him. All that you need and infinitely more than you could even ask or imagine because all of the blessings of God are yes in Jesus. So, so what? So cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. He's the strong tower, so run into Him to be saved. He's the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, so listen to Him. Follow Him. Feast where He leads you. Lie down in the green pastures that He brings you by to restore your soul. The truth here means that all of the fullness of God dwelling in Jesus, God's door is not shut. 
His door is not shut. Do you know the invitation of Jesus consistently in Scripture is come, come, come? Here's just a few of them. Mark 4, 19. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Matthew 19, 14. Let the little children come to me. John 6, 37. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. John 11. John 11 is a scene of mourners. And his friend Lazarus, dead now four days, has been mummified and put into a tomb and sealed with a stone over the entrance. And what was the command of Jesus to Lazarus? He said, Lazarus, come out. Come out. To the weary, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. To the thirsty, Jesus' invitation is still, come to him. And matter of fact, this is the last invitation in the word of God in the very last chapter of the Bible There's the invitation by Jesus, come to Him and take of the water of life freely without cost, without price. You see, that's what the divine accessibility is like because of the person of Jesus Christ. He's always accessible. So the fullest of God is never absent, always present, in Jesus and the fullness of God is always accessible in Jesus. And then number three, the fullness of God is inexhaustible in Jesus. Inexhaustible. It means this, it is never depleted. It is never diminished. He doesn't spend it down. It is always full Infinitely complete. There's as much fullness of God in Jesus Christ today as there ever was. On the final day of His return, there shall be found as much fullness in Jesus the Savior as when the very first sinner came to Him and was saved. All the fullness dwells in Jesus. That means never to be exhausted, never to be depleted, never to be diminished in any degree whatsoever. So, guilt-stained sinner. Listen. The blood of Jesus that cleanses the crimson tide of the guilt of your sin and makes your sins as white as snow is as effective today as it was when the dying thief hung beside him on the cross and was plunged into that fountain and emerged that day in paradise like Jesus promised him. To the despairing sinner, there is as much consolation in Christ today as when He said to the woman, to the adulterer, go, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. You see, you cannot diminish the grace of God in Jesus because all the fullness of God dwells in Him, present, ongoing present. He's as great a Savior today as when Mary Magdalene was delivered from seven devils. His power over evil within is as victorious today as it was the day that he looked at the man possessed by a legion of demons and he commanded them to come out 
and instantly they obeyed and the man was freed. For time without end, he will exercise the same infinite power of forgiving and renewing and delivering and sanctifying and perfecting those he saves. You see, Jesus not only had the capacity to contain all the fullness of God, Jesus had the immutability to retain all the fullness of God, and he retains it forevermore without end. Present tense, unending, the fullness of God dwells in him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Son abideth forever, and so His fullness, divine fullness, abides forever. He is the priest after the order of Melchizedek without beginning or ending of days. He is the eternal source of salvation to all who come to Him, for He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. Do you know Him? Do you know Him as your Savior? The invitation is come. Come freely and take of the water of life. Don't bring anything to buy it. The condition that you need is sin and you've got it. And the promise He provides is forgiveness and He gives it freely, lavishly, graciously. Come. And if you're a believer and you're walking through turmoil and heartache and sorrow and difficulty and distraction and competition with the things of the world and complacency and apathy, the same answer is Jesus come. Come. He's the one that revives. He's the one that compels. He's the one that sends you the Spirit to empower you. Come to Jesus. Because in Him all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. And you'll find in Him all that you want, all that you need beyond your wildest imaginations forevermore. Come to Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Grow in your knowledge of Him. Would you please stand? Lord Jesus, I just close that meditation on you with a heart full of worship and adoration because of who you are. You're the very fullness of God. In a heart of thanksgiving, unspeakable because of what you've done, the price you've paid, the victory you've won, the spirit that you've given. the truth that you give, the work that you're fully committed to completing in everyone that comes to you. And I thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for the promise 
that no one will snatch us out of your hand. The promise that nothing can separate us from your love. The promise of the seal of the Spirit that guarantees our eternal inheritance with you. That promise of your keeping, sustaining, persevering grace in our lives. The promise of the beatific vision, seeing you in all of your glory and in that glimpse when you return this transforming power from seeing you unveiled in glory, radically transforming us and completing the lifetime of sanctification that we've been working on when we see you as you truly are and in that sight seeing all that our heart ultimately desires that forever wins the battle leaving nothing else competing for it having found in you our supreme delight and treasure Thank you for that eternal glory that you're going to share with us. You're going to glorify us in your presence forevermore. Thank you. So just with hearts bowed before you, we just say to you, Lord Jesus, thank you. We worship you. We adore and praise You. We exalt You. We magnify You. For You are truly worthy to be praised. Worthy to be followed. Worthy to be emulated. Help us toward that end in Jesus' name. Amen.